Hey guys, back at the playground again, huh? Yep. You know what this playground could use? A wine country. Heck yeah! And some waves, so we could go surfing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that! A redwood forest would be cool. I'm in! Ah, ski slopes. Let's do it! Um, can a girl go shopping? Yeah, baby! Wait! Did we just invent California? Discover why California is the ultimate playground at visitcalifornia.com. So I, I know you've got a lot going on, but remember, I'm here for you. So bother me when no one's listening because I will. Bother me when it feels like it won't get better because it can. Bother me because you're never a bother. Whether it's a low point or a crisis, get help for yourself or a friend. Learn more at neverabother.org or call or text 988, available 24-7. It's time to get inside the Giants home. Let's go, let's go, let's go. On Giants.com. I like it, I like it, I and like it. And the Giants mobile app. Ooh, give me some juice. Part of the Giants podcast network. Let's roll. Welcome to the newest edition of the Giants Little Podcast brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the New York football Giants. Well, over the last couple of weeks, folks, we've had a lot of fun interviews. We've interviewed former NFL general managers like Thomas Dimitrov and Randy Mueller. Uh, we've talked to former Hall of Fame players like Kurt Warner. We've talked to media scouts, but some days... You just want to get crusty. So I went out there and I found that the oldest, crustiest scout that makes Krusty the Crown Clown look fresh. And he is Brian Broadus, former NFL scout, now host down in Dallas on radio. And of course, he's also part of the Dallas Cowboys draft show. Brian, we've done this a bunch of years in a row. I really appreciate it. Are you like, is this inside scout in you still kind of getting the tingles now that we're about a week away from the draft? Yeah, John, and uh, thank you so much again for having me. I, I feel always privileged and honored to be with you. I have the utmost respect, not only for the Giants organization, but for you and the job that you do. So to be on your platform, uh, it does mean a lot to me. Uh, you don't uh, take these for granted very often, and I'm, I'm being really, really nice to you right thank now you. because I do love being on with you. Uh, I, I The interactions that you and I have had over the years, it's educated me. That's we always talk about the the draft show, investigate and educate. Well, I think you do a great job of educating your fans. So to be on with you is a great privilege. Uh, yeah, this when people ask me what I miss most about the NFL, this is it. This time of year, the the putting together the board, stacking the board, the discussions, uh, the information, the trading, the learning about players. Um, you know, if you and I were sitting in a war room together and you were scouting the Northeast and I was down in the Southeast and you're presenting players and I'm like, man, John's really got it together on these Penn state kids. You know, he, he's, he's selling me on these guys, man. They're better than my kids down at LSU. They're better than my kids at Ole Miss. You know, this is where you learn. This is where scouts in the building learn about the, what's going on in the area. You get so focused on your part of the country and your region and and uh, this is where you present this is where you present for uh may potentially ownership like here in dallas you know ownership being the general manager uh this is where you present to the head coach who doesn't get out very much this is where you present to your other uh scouting buddies and so this is important it's an important time of the year and it's a uh, it's one of those things where it this is the best opportunity we're given every year to to build your team and uh, I'm, I'm really happy that the, a lot of these, uh, the scouts, but the media scouts, uh, find it's very, very important, uh, to, to do a quality job of it. You can find Brian on the GBAG nation two two to 7 PM Monday through Friday on one Oh five, three, the fan. Of course, I mentioned the draft show podcast, also the love of the star podcast. Make sure you go check that out. And Brian, that's what we're going to do here today. You know, we've gone through, you know, interviews with the guys, different questions. And I just want to kind of go through some of these positions and see how we have them stack, compare our stacks, debate. Maybe we can convince each other or something. But before we get there, something you've talked about in, in some of your programming this off season, what I think is interesting is the role of the scout in the meetings that are going up, Right above my head, right here at the facility at, at uh, the, the Quest Diagnostic Training Center, where the GM is in there with all the scouts, and now the coaches are involved too, putting this final board together. Put yourself back in the shoes of Brian Broadus, the scout. What is your role in these meetings, and how do you have to massage what you say to make sure the group can come to the right decision on all these players? Yeah, John, it's uh, it, it's. As I mentioned, it's such an important time 
because you want to come to a consensus uh, as a group. You're not going to win every battle that you fight. Uh, there's some scouts that go in with the attitude of, of like, you no, know, my guy's better than your guy. That really doesn't work too well in a in a in an NFL war room in a draft room. Um, you have to put your ego aside. You have to be able to know what battles to fight, when to back up, when and you're not looking for group speak or you know, but the consensus you need to have. Um, there's certain scouts that are really good evaluating certain positions. I always held uh, certain scouts, and and I'll give you an example. Uh, Mark Ross, who was with you guys way back in the day. Uh, Mark and I, his first, first job was with me in Philadelphia uh, with, uh, you know, when, uh, when he got out of Princeton. And Mark was a young scout, very brash, very bold, very, you know, very in-your-face kind of guy. And But I, I respected him for that. But we had some other scouts like with Dan Shanka, uh, you know, it was, it was a guy, Jake Hollum. We had these older veteran scouts. So you always have this mix of young and old guys, which is really, really cool. And to hear the perspective, but you have to be able to understand who has certain strengths in certain areas. If somebody speaks up about, it, say they're, they, they've got a really good run over the years of wide receiver play. And they've, you know, every time they talk about a wide receiver, it seems like, boy, they're on this. They've got this down. They understand. Or an offensive tackle or, a, a, you know, a quarterback. You know, cer certain scouts have these abilities when they say something, you listen, and then you have to give it some priority. Okay, this scout really liked this guy because of this. This scout didn't like him so much, but this scout doesn't always see it the right. So you have to be able to, as – a general manager or uh, somebody, a primary decision maker in the room, you have to be able to balance out the scouts with the coaches, with the medical, all these things play a big role in how you proceed to put together your board and your stack, because you get to that stack. And when I talk about the stack for folks, uh, the way I did it in green Bay and other places, Philadelphia, when I ran the draft there, is you put players from, say, how many names you have on your board, one to, say, 150. You put those guys in order, and you try not to jump tags. What you do is that tells you, that stack tells you how you would take these players. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it you know, we've, we've had all the arguments to get the stack together. So once that happens, uh, once that's put up, everybody knows the direction we're going to go. That's our guy. That's our guy. That's our guy. That's okay. And as they start to come off the board, then it gives you a, a, a clear picture of where you need to go. But it's very important as a, as the primary person uh, in, in charge of the room to be able to manage the scouts, manage the coaches, keep everybody from getting completely mad at each other. You know, coaches will come in and say things that the scouts don't. You know, I had a, a scout one time look at a coach and coach said something about a player and scout looked at the coach and said, you don't see me calling third down defenses, do you? And he, what he was trying to say is, don't tell me how to do my job. I'm not – and then you have to kind of – maybe you take a break. Maybe you let everybody cool off a little bit. You know, but there's, there's discussions in these rooms. It's not always just everybody's so nice and pleasant, but when you walk out of that room, you still are a group. You still are the organization. You're still the football giants, you know. You got to keep, you know, take the ego out of it, but it's a, it's a very, very important part of what the Giants, the Cowboys, the Commanders, the Eagles, what they're going to do this year to turn, try and win this division. All right, I'm going to leave the quarterbacks for last, just because I know we're going to have a fun. <laughs> I know we're going to have a fun disagreement on on at least one of the players, which will be fun. Let's yeah. start with running back, a position that I think yeah. has been forgotten a little bit in the NFL. And I know both of us are kind of knee deep in running back. You, you know, yeah. focusing on the Cowboys down there, they don't really have a running back right now mm -hmm. that they can roll out there with 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 any confidence to start. Uh, the Giants signed Devin Singletary, but obviously they lost Saquon Barkley. And Brian, I'm sitting here, I'm staring at seven third round tags on on my board. I don't have anyone with a with a second round grade myself. Um, and, and I'll just give you my seven and then we can yeah. kind of go back and forth. Uh, Trey Benson is my top guy. I worry about, even though he's, he's a good size and he's strong. He just hasn't carried the load a ton because he hasn't been asked to, uh, Jonathan Brooks is my number two. 
Ray Davis, who I think is is solid as a rock, but just doesn't have that one elite trait that pushes him ahead of the other two guys is my third guy. I like Marshawn Lloyd from USC just because I think he's big. He's almost 220 pounds, which I think for a running back is important, but he also is really good side-to-side quickness. I think his vision could use a little bit of work. And then my other three guys in that round, I love Will Shipley out of Clemson. I think mm-hmm. he's quick. He's a really good receiver. I think he finds the hole well. He's shifty. Though, again, I don't think he's a guy that can get more than 12 to 15 touches in a game. Um, I like Audrey Estime out of Notre Dame. Big guy, I think, more elusive than 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 people think. And he's certainly big enough to to kind of be your go-to back in, in all sorts of situations. And then I like Blake Corum. I think he is a guy that can get the ball 17, 18 times in a game. Um, just a short area quickness. And I, I like short running backs. I think they get lost behind the offensive line and allows yeah. them to have a low center of gravity to avoid big hits and, and have really good contact balance. So those are my third round guys. Then I have a bunch of guys with, with, with fourth round grade two that aren't quite far behind them to be totally honest with you. But those are my seven that I have with straight up threes. Yeah. I I've got actually a couple of second round backs and I've got Brooks and Benson flip, but they're both second round guys on my, on my board. And um, the thing that I love about Brooks out of Texas is the ability to run. I think he's a three down back. The the running aspect of him, I think he catches the ball extremely well. The vision, the ability to make cuts. I've seen him make several jump cuts, lateral cuts. I think he's got an elusive trait to his game. Uh you start to talk about outside zone runs. Okay. I mean, he'll press that edge hard and then cut the ball back. Uh, so, you know, you can see him make those types of cuts. I think he's got the ability to be a home run hitter. I love the way he finishes runs. Now, the problem with Brooks is he suffered an ACL injury against TCU in November. Uh, the Cowboys doctor, Dan Cooper, uh, did the surgery. And so if uh, the Cowboys are looking at him, which I believe they are, uh, they have a really good understanding of what Brooks and what he's potentially what his outlook is after Dr. Cooper uh, with the surgery and stuff like that and what he was able to do. And and they feel like that maybe that he'll be back and ready to go for training camp. Um, The thing about Benson, I think is interesting is he kind of scoots along the grass. He's kind of, you know, you don't see a lot of uh, high knee action type of a runner, but those feet stay really low to the ground I think he creates a lot of big plays with the ball in his hands, the yeah. ability to make defenders miss in the open field. I think he's a patient runner. Uh, he plays with burst. He's got speed. He can really cover some ground once he gets going. And you know, when he makes that first guy miss, if there's penetration, he, he, you know, he can, he can make that guy, he can make a miss if there's that penetration like I was talking about. But he's also got the power to run through arm tacklers and bounce off defenders, and he catches the ball very, very well. So that's kind of why, you know, I would have Brooks and Benson, those two guys. It sounds like a country Western duo, Brooks <laughs> and Benson. But uh, but that's how th- th- I would see. I-, I really do like what you're saying about, uh, you know, the, the young man from USC. Uh, th- that to me, when you when you look at, you know, how uh, how he plays and, and, and Lloyd, he's he's one of those guys that. He transferred from South Carolina. He had a torn ACL in 2020, but he's got explosive traits. You mentioned him. He's 5'9". He's 220 pounds. The burst, the acceleration, he can get to the hole, to and through in a, in a hurry. He can bounce it outside without any issues, and he can really kick it into top gear instantly. I think he's got the speed to break away. He can finish long runs. I've seen opponents have the angles on him, and he'll just outrun them. And so – second, third guy miss, you know, there's some wiggle and ability to adjust on the move. And I, I really do uh, you know, like the player a lot. Uh, I'm, I tend to also, the other players I have, I, I, I like what you're just talking about with Ray Davis. I've got Davis behind Wright uh, from Tennessee, uh, Allen uh, from Oregon, and then, or excuse me, Allen from uh, Wisconsin and Irving from Oregon. So, those are kind of in the order of the guys that that how I would have them. But I, I like what you've done with Benson, Brooks, and Lloyd. I think those guys are really good players. The Blake Corm one is fascinating to me. Um, maybe I've seen it a little bit because of Ezekiel Elliott here being with the Cowboys, is the number of carries a guy's had in his career. And is that going to be a factor? in them playing down the road. That's also uh, a Shipley thing too, by the way. He said it is, a Ship- at Clemson. it is a Shipley thing. And Shipley, as you mentioned, is a really good football player. 
He catches it very well. He can make people miss, but he's played a ton of snaps as a running back. So I think that I'm kind of mindful about that when I'm looking at these backs. Jalen Wright, I think, is interesting. You brought him up briefly. Yeah. I And I wasn't high in this player last year either, and I, I was made to look foolish about it. I wasn't a big Devon Achain guy last year. Right. I just didn't see, like, the complete back to me, but he's right. just such good straight-ahead speed. And maybe that's why I write with kind of he's he's actually the the eighth guy on my list. He has that mm-hmm. cheat third round, fourth round grade. I right. just don't aside from the a big play here or there, I just don't know if I see that that other stuff where he can be my down in, down out back. You know what I mean? Right. Um, you know, the the thing that that I liked about Wright is the finish. I, I think there's I think this guy, and you mentioned A Chain, A Chain had the ability to score from anywhere on the field. And I'm not saying that Wright is that guy, but I do feel like that he's got that kind of potential to be able to do that. And when you have that ability to score from anywhere, but he also is really tough. I've seen him run where he puts his head down and just plows forward if things get clogged up. So the power to gain yards when there's none, seen him burst through several arm tacklers, but he's not going to give you a clean shot on him in the open field. Again, catching the ball. I think that's so important, John. You, you understand that. You understand how this league is. As a back, you got to be able to have some screen game ability. You've got to be able to maybe run some routes where they can throw it to you and you can make some uh, make some yards after catch. The thing that I really liked about Wright is I thought he was a solid pass protector. Mm. You know, I mean, he's going to take guys on square. He's going to keep his man off the quarterback. Natural playmaker. So I, I those complete traits and games. I kind of like Jalen Wright out of Tennessee for those reasons. Do you want to get your take on two other running backs, guys, that I probably like more than other people? I'm a big Isaiah Davis fan out of South Dakota State. Uh, He's not not flashy, but if you want a guy that's going to grind out yards between the tackles, he's your guy. And then a guy, it's funny. I don't know if I've ever seen a running back quite this raw before, but you watch Tyrone Tracy play. The guy's yeah. a Tasmanian devil. He runs, right. he's spinning, his arms and knees are all over the place. You could tell he's just learning how to play running back. But right. you look at a lot of the underlying metrics, his breaking, his, his broken tackle oh, yeah. rate is great. Oh, his yeah. yards after contact stuff is great. Yeah. But my God, this guy, he it looks like you like just got the kid at the playground that's never played football before, but you could tell he's a good athlete. You put him on your team, you just give him the ball and tell him to go. Yeah. That's what he looks like, like as a running back. Yeah, at 5'11 and 209 pounds, I went back and watched him play at Iowa as a wide receiver. And Iowa used him more as that wide receiver type of guy than a running back when you really dig in. The one year at Purdue, you mentioned the metrics. The time speed at 448 is good, but you don't always see him play that fast. The explosive numbers are his vertical at 40 inches, the short shuttle at 418. It's it's funny that sometimes he doesn't play this way, but he does have power, and you can hand in the ball in various ways. You, you know, he's, the strength in his game might be as a receiver. You know, he's strong-handed. He tracks the ball. He's competitive. He's reliable. When you put the ball in his hands, you, you he can make plays in traffic. He can make plays down the field. He's got some red zone versatility to his game. He's comfortable wherever he's aligned, the toughness, the finish. The concern is, like I said, the testing numbers don't always show up in the play, but you have to acknowledge that they're there. So my last line in my notes would be, say, draft and figure out ways to use him. 5'11", 209, this guy has traits that you would like to have in a running back that can also help you in the receiving game. Yeah, maybe that maybe kick return as well, right? With the new kick return. And the new rules. Yep. Yep. He's a guy yep. that could fit in there too. All right. Let's jump to wide receiver. I know I spend a ton of time on these top three guys, Brian, because we've talked about them a bunch. Um, yeah. Ivan Harrison with neighbors just a tick below him. And then a Dunze, still like a top ten caliber player, but mm-hmm. you know, a little bit further away from neighbors than neighbors is to Harrison. I just think neighbor I think first of all, I think Marvin Harrison for a guy that size, he's a six four guy that runs like he's yeah. six foot and he's so polished as a route runner. Yeah. Um, and he's so big. I think it's really that simple. Neighbors is just super explosive. And then a Dunze doesn't have a weakness. I, you know, I don't th- I don't see that, you know, besides the contested catch stuff, which is off the charts good, I don't see that ridiculous athletic trait for him that I love. I think in some of the man-on-man coverage, there's not 
a lot of separation, but there's enough separation for him given his size and strength to, to make the play. But that's kind of, I have all the, those three guys stacked up and yeah. all three, if I'm in the top 10, I'd be happy to walk away with any three of them. Yeah. Uh, Adunze is uh man. I think you nailed it. Perfect. I think he's one of the most confident wide receivers in the country. Uh, I mean that the hands are outstanding. The ability to catch in him. I mean, he makes big play after big play, super reliable. He's clutch. Uh, a little bit of a long strider. He can cover some ground when route. He was a high school sprinter, and it you see that at times with the ball in his hands, the remarkable body control, the balance, the smaller, the tighter the area, the more likely you're going to see him coming down with the ball. I mean, he's got a feel for how to adjust. He makes reception when it appears he has no shot. And I big time route runner, as far as I was concerned. You go back and you watch the game against Washington State in the Apple Cup. It's fourth and one. What do they do? They hand him the ball in a reverse, and it sets up the game winning points. This guy plays at a very, very high level. I don't, you said it. I don't see many flaws in his game at all. I really, really don't. He's going to make somebody a really, a really outstanding player. The thing about neighbors, and this is, um, I always have to be careful about this because I, with the school at LSU. So, you know, when you start to talk with some of these, the, the quarterback and the receivers that they have, this kid, uh, and I've seen them all, this, this kid is, is when the, the Jeffersons and, and the Chases and stuff like that, this kid is as good as those guys are. He, he is that good. And, I mean, he generates a ton of speed. He's an outstanding route runner. He could sell it with the best of them. He's a master of the double move, the stutter go. He could turn receivers around in a heartbeat or, or defenders around a heartbeat. Excuse me. He gets full speed in the blink of an eye, tracks the ball. You do not see him lose focus or concentration. He comes back for the ball. He's super friendly for his, his quarterback. So uh, yeah, he's like a running back with the ball in his hands in the open field, run after catch. He's a game breaker. He's physical. He gets North and South in a hurry. There's so much to like about it. The thing about LSU is, you're playing them. Opponents know he's going to get the ball, and he still has the skill to come up with it. That's what you have to really like about this kid. He's got that thick lower body too, where he can break some. Yeah, he's six foot. He's two hundred pounds, and he, I can say, I, I watched him his whole career, and I, I love the kid. I love the fact he played at my alma mater, uh, and he, and he, as I mentioned, I, I've, I've seen all the great ones come through. This kid will be the next one he will be the next one. He, I, I think he's going to be a great pro. I really do. You love turf. You're good at it. So you start a turf biz. Business grows. Your savings grow. Become the most celebrated name in turf. Are you ready for all that life brings? John Settle Podcast is brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. From game day to every day, Citizens is made ready for Giant fans with insights, guidance, and solutions. Learn more at citizensbank.com. All right, Brian, next group of wide receivers. I got two guys sitting here in, in my next tier, and I've gone back and forth between A.D. Mitchell and Brian Thomas Jr., mm -hmm. and I feel like you have some pretty good insight on these two guys. I like Mitchell better on tape, but I don't like the fact that he shows up at the combine and basically says publicly, yeah, when I knew I wasn't getting the ball, I wasn't going to run hard. Don't yeah. love that, and I wonder if that reflects on other parts of his game that might show up that haven't shown up yet in, until he gets into the National Football League. What have you heard about Mitchell from Texas and some of that stuff? And Brian Thomas Jr., I think he's still very raw, but boy, right. so, some of those physical traits. A guy his size, mm -hmm. he even has some wiggle to him. Mm -hmm. uh, your thoughts on those two? Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. My son is a sophomore at uh, the University of Texas, and so he knows quite a bit of these kids. Matter of fact, he's befriended uh, him and Arch Manning are, are really good friends. And so Bennett uh, likes to talk <laughs> in football, and I asked my ass been all the time. Like, hey, what about these kids? What about this Texas kid? You know, and there's plenty of them, you know, to, and uh, Bennett kind of puts his money where his mouth is my son. He, he traveled to Alabama, to Tuscaloosa to watch him play. So he'll go around and watch these guys play. And, 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 but he gives me good scouting reports on him. The thing with Mitchell is you would not believe that he weighs 205 pounds, but he does. He is so thinly built, but he's, he, he does weigh that. And, you know, he, he, He's generally a strong-handed player. You watch the Alabama game. Arnold, the very talented corner, knocked the ball out of his hands. Really, that was the only time you ever saw him not just, you know, just hang on to a ball that way. 
he'll catch his share of high point passes. He runs a lot of vertical routes. He runs a lot of crossing routes. He tracks the ball. He can find it when he finds it, he extends it. You know, he had a huge touch. I mentioned the Alabama game, like adjusting over his shoulder, uh, the initial quickness. I don't really know about the top end speed for as many of the vertical routes as he executes, but he is a fluid mover. He can create separation. He's a long arm player with a soft hands, reliable catch radius. We've talked about all that. Um, I like the stop, uh, the start, stop quickness into his game, how he gets up the field. Uh, I, I mean, there's, there's times where, you know, he is just, he's just making play after play after play. And so, you know, maybe, you know, he transferred from George and he kind of reminded me a little bit of when George Pickens came out of Georgia in 2022, that you saw these incredible plays and the ability to go down the field and, and make plays like that. I know Pickens makes plays for the Steelers. Uh, quite a bit and this kid's got that same same kind of ability when you look at when you look at thomas and again here's uh, you know i i'll try to not put my my lsu alumni hat on here but you mentioned it's 63 209 this guy's a fluid moving guy for a guy that bid with with each stride he takes he creates separation he's very savvy a reliable pass catcher he does a fine job of tracking the ball down the field there were plenty of times uh, where the ball was thrown and he had to make an adjusting catch. Uh, you know, he plays in tight spaces that, you know, in the, in the games where you see him, they throw the ball in the corner, 6'3", 209. He goes up, he gets it, hands, uh, hands gets the ball, feet down, concentration to make those acrobatic plays. He, uh, he could track it from either shoulder. I mean, they throw the ball inside, he's tracking it outside, he's tracking it. There's an element of toughness to his game. And I think, where he'll need a little bit of work is if people get up on him and press, they and they'll try and knock him around a little bit. That's where he has to kind of figure some things out. But when he sees that ball, he is going to get it. So uh, I could see why people have him as high as they do. LSU had two of the best receivers in the country. I think this kid led the nation in touchdowns. So that tells you a lot about uh, his kind of ability to finish plays. And now I think the next group is really the fun one, right? And I have, I think, let me look at my numbers right here. I have 12 guys, if you count a third, <laughs> yeah. fourth thing. To, to steal or... Bill, yeah, to steal Bill Parcells' line, you got them stacked in there like club sandwiches. Yeah, you, I do. Yeah. I, second and third round is just stuffed with wide receivers. And, they, sure. they're, all, and, and they're all good players, Brian. All good I mean, players. I got to be yeah. honest with you. They are like, good players. My, my next four guys, like, depending on the day you talk to me, right, is where I have him right. Right now I have a McConkey, Tony Franklin, Pearsall, Xavier Worthy. But yeah. you talk to me in two days, I might have a couple of those guys flipped either way, and then not behind, too far behind them, or Keon Coleman, Devontae Walker. So yeah. I got these guys just really stacked up against each other, and these are guys going to be good, I think, better than average starters on day one walking yeah. into the league. No, I think if I could focus on a couple of them. Go ahead. McConk McConkey from Georgia is – one of my favorite players. He's at six foot. He's 186 pounds. I mean, he's got a slippery side to his game. He's one of the best route runners I studied in this draft. He has deceptive speed. He's got a burst. You don't think he's going anywhere. And with the ball, the next thing you know, he's off to the races. Uh, the short area quickness is really good. He creates opportunities at all levels of the defense. He is a precise route runner. He's got a feel for how to set up defenders the quickness off the line, the ability to escape. He catches the ball with ease. If it's anywhere near him, he's going to make a play. That's the type of player he is. And I wouldn't bet against this guy having a great career in the in the NFL. Now, the only thing is health, right? Because he's had some injuries. That's the only the, thing the that health, I worry about. Yeah, the health. And that's something that we're going to have to, like, we're going to have to check on uh, the head situation. You mentioned Ricky Pearsall from Florida. This guy is transferred from Arizona State. He has gotten better each year he's played college football. I went back. I was curious. I wanted to see what kind of player he was at Arizona State. And he he did some really some quality thing. I mean, he finds ways to get open. He's got quickness. He's got speed. He can make sharp cuts. He can get the defender off balance. He's not afraid to take his routes anywhere on the field. Plays well on the move. The hands are excellent. He's got the ability to make circus catches. Few receivers have the skill set that he does catching the football. I, I was constantly... Well, I mean, I think it's Mertz, the transfer from uh, Wisconsin that was his quarterback at Florida. And the ball wasn't always where it needed to be. But but he was constantly adjusting for passes. 
and making plays. He takes big hits. He gets up. He's super reliable in critical moments. I, I, I see this guy as a really high high IQ player. And so he knows how to find the spaces. Again, that toughness about his game. I, I, you can use this guy in the slot. He's going he's gonna to kill people there. You can use him as a kick returner. He's going to help you there. But you could also play him on the outside. He's just, like I say, a high IQ player that knows how to play the game at a high level. It was funny. I'm watching, I believe it was Renardo Green, or maybe it was a different. And I'm watching the corner, and I'm like, wow, this guy is awesome. He's having a great yeah. year. I'm going through it. And then yeah. Ricky Pearsall shows up as like, <laughs> as like the next yeah. to last tape on, on the schedule. Yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, and wow. I mean, Pearsall just there, just McC- the craft yeah. of playing of wide receiver. Just absolutely. Yeah, and and I and I know why you have all those guys stacked in there because and this, John, this is what I want to ask you if I can ask a question. Yeah, please. Um, when you look at these receivers, do you feel like that maybe teams will say, I don't want to take a receiver in the second because I might get the same player in the third? Do you feel like that maybe the position stretches so much that you'll see somebody like, okay, I'm going to nab somebody here. I could go back to the receiver and maybe get a guy like a Pearsall or Holt from Washington or somebody like that, that, that you maybe could have gotten the second round. I think there is a little bit of a gap going from this group that we just talked about to the, Jalen McMillan's, the Malachi sure. Corley's, the Jalen Pokes. I don't have Xavier Leggett until the third round myself. Sure, sure. Um, I think he's just really raw as a route runner. And I don't see that, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't see the – a lot of people talk about his yards after catch stuff as though he's right. Debo Samuel. I just don't see that on, on tape enough for me. I mm-hmm. see a guy that's a six foot one contested catch guy, and that does not get me that excited. Sure. Um, but he has the body for it, right? So Absolutely, I think there's yeah. a little bit of a drop-off for me. Uh, but if you're a team where, you know, if you draft a guy that ends up being a number three instead of a number two and you're trying to fill out your room and you're good with that, I would understand the idea of waiting. But if you're looking for a legit, what I think could be really good number two wide receiver, I would mm-hmm. try to get one of these guys in the second before you get yeah. to that next group in the third. I just, yeah, there's there's a couple positions I feel like that stretch pretty good. The, the receiver, maybe the corner, maybe the edges. Uh, they seem to stretch a little bit more. I wonder if people are going to say, hmm, these guys are kind of packed in there pretty good. We can maybe wait. Let's go get one of these. Like, let's go get a defensive tackle now. There's not a lot of those guys. We can come back and address this wide receiver room if we have to. Who's the day three wide receiver that you think you like more than everybody else? I like Malik Washington out of Virginia. I think he's going to be a good pro. Yeah, I, you know, I, the, the, the guy that I really like is McCaffrey from Rice. And uh, the, to, he is – he's one of those guys, I think he's learning the position and that, you know, of course the bloodlines are there for, for what he – you know, for his dad was a really nice player. Mom was a really good soccer player. Uh, brother, of course, we all know what uh, – we all know what the, the brother situation is there. But – I think he's learning the position. He was a quarterback at Nebraska. They made him a receiver. He's played receiver at Rice. The concentration, the ball tracking skills, he'll make some of the most unreal receptions you'll ever see. I think he does a really good job of putting himself in position to receive the ball. He can adjust to the off-target throw. If it's in his area, he's likely to come down with it, the savvy, natural kind of receiver of the ball. So I think if you if you, you said, hey, give me a guy in the in that day three, that kind of puts uh, puts it together for me. I, I would say that that uh, he would be a guy that that I would look at. I'll give you another one too that I really like. I don't know if you've seen uh, Bub Means from. He is, uh, he is next on my list. I, I was okay. I was hoping you would bring up Bub. Well, let me let me let me let me let you talk about Bub Means, and I'll just agree with everything you say. How about no, that? No, no, I, I <laughs> he is literally the next receiver I have to watch. Yeah. I've not gone to him yet. So please tell me all about him. Okay, well, this is this is this is one of those guys. He's had an interesting college career because he was a defensive back at Tennessee. Then he transferred to Louisiana Tech to become a receiver. Then he went on to Pittsburgh, and so, but he's an impressive player. He's six one. He's two hundred twelve pounds. When you when you start to like watch tape of those ACC games, he makes a ton of contested catches. Uh, you know, it, it was like 
it was crazy the number of catches he made. I think he had 11 of them in the just alone in the 2023 season. I think that was the second most in the ACC. Five of his receiving touchdowns were 20 plus yards. He's got a knack for going and getting the football. He'll make receptions where he's at full extension and somehow he's able to bring the ball down. He'll make those circus catches I've talked about with some of the others. The routes will go inside. They'll go up the field. He works the middle of the field well. The, the ball's going his direction. He's going to catch it. He's got upper body strength. He lowers his pads to run through defenders. He can make people miss in the open field. He will need a little work as a route runner, but he just has a natural feel for the way he plays a game. I feel like that his best football is ahead of him. I, I just do. He, you know, I know he's he's kind of trying to learn, but yeah, he's been at a couple different stops, but at 6'1", 212 pounds, someone's going to get a really good football player here that can do a lot of things for you. All right, well, let's show them the tight ends rather than going through this whole list here, Brian. Yeah. Uh, I only have – I have Brad Bowers, obviously, as, as kind of your blue-chip top 10, top 12 type pick. And right. then I only have two other tight ends with – with day two picks on my board here. And I'll just pin out one guy that I think I like better than most people. Right. And Ben Sinat, when I watched him on tape for a guy, the way he's shaped, I thought yeah. his ability to really snap off routes at the top yeah. of the route. She was actually pretty good for yeah. a guy that I kind of see almost as like a, you know, Kyle Juszczyk type of player. I think, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, when he, when he gets to the next level, you can run out of the backfield, he was split out wide. He was on the line. He's not the biggest guy, but he's a willing blocker. I would be very happy drafting Sanat on day two, knowing all the different ways you could use him. Talk about him if you want, or if there's another tight end that you think you like more than most. No, I mean, I think you got Ben Sanat. I think you got him right. He's 6'4", he's 250 pounds. You line him up. You, you mentioned Kyle Juszczyk. What does Kyle Juszczyk do? He lines up all over the formation. Guy moves really well for size. He does have some foot quickness to his game. Yeah. I, I think he's got really good hands. He only had two drops for the season. Uh, if you look at the metrics on him as a, as a player, but the thing about him, is he he is a he is a good blocker. I mean, he is a really good blocker. And so, the the uh, you know the the thing that he the plays the out routes that he runs the speed outs those were like two of his biggest plays. When they need their first down, they throw him the ball in that speed out the out. Uh, you know, I think that to me, when you the athletic ability, he gets what he can to run after catch the balance, the toughness. You know. I love the versatility, and I, I've just it, it never has been easy for him. It seems like, but he manages to see it through. The thing about him too, he was a, a walk on at Kansas State. That's kind of when you start to talk about players that you know have kind of had things a little rough. He's one of those guys that's kind of been able uh, to fight things through. If I can mention one other guy in this tight end. Yeah. Jarrett Wiley from TCU. I don't know if you've seen him. I have. I, I like him more than I like Theo Johnson, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah, and Theo Johnson's high on a lot of people's board. Uh, he, this guy's a transfer from Texas. Mentioned he's 6'6". Six, six, he's 249 in, in, there at TCU. He catches the ball really, really well, and he's a tall guy, and he, so he can adjust when it's delivered. You do not see him play a lot of in-line stuff. He's not – when we talk in-line, that's tackle, next to the tackle. He's usually a wing or a move guy, but – the coaches at TCU created ways to get him the ball, but he's got strength to run through arm tackles. He's got power. Uh, you know, he can find soft spots in the zone. He's got, he gives effort as a blocker and a second level blocker, but he's not a killer by any means in that. His contact balance as a blocker will come and go. That's why he's not an inline guy. But, man, this is a red zone guy. He can separate. He can make contested catches. He's got straight line speed. I just feel like to me that there's a guy that at 6'6", 249, you, you've got talking about a big target that could work the middle of the field. I wouldn't be surprised if some people have him higher on their board. Yeah, I have Stover and Wiley as my only two fourth-round tight ends. So those sure. are the two guys I like in, in, yep. in round four. Different type of players, but I yes. both have them kind of yes. stacked yes. You know, in relatively close. All right, let's go to the offensive line here, Brian. Um, the offensive tackle to me is is fascinating. I know you love Fuanga a lot at yes. uh, out of Oregon State. I want to ask you about one thing, but you said you, I remember listening on one of your shows, you can't really find the weakness watching his tape. Yeah. Look at some of the in-game team stuff at the senior bowl. 
Uh -huh. Adisa Isaac gives him some issues with some yeah. speed rush. And maybe yeah. maybe this is me being scarred from, from, from Evan Neal the last couple of years. Uh -huh. I worry about his ability to really get wide on his kick and handle speed rushers outside. While I see Latham, he gets out there easily. He gets those long arms and the meat hawks on guys, and he locks yeah. them down. I, I like Fuanga as a guy that can you know play inside, power. He flies off the ball straight ahead, good athlete. I wonder about his lateral ability to get wide against some of those better speed rushers. To me, I, man, I saw a really good foot athlete. That's, and, you know, and I, and I'm going to admit, I did not look at the stuff at the senior bowl. I just went and did his tape that he had at Oregon state. I kind of felt like though, that to me, there was, there wasn't anything that he couldn't do. And I just, it was one of no, those. No, Brian, honestly, it, it it did not show up on his game tape much, to be totally honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 man, I just saw a guy with natural strength. I saw leverage. I saw power. I saw him stoning defenders. I mean, I felt like he played relaxed as a pass while he didn't appear hurried or stressed out. I thought he was a light footed guy. I, again, I watched the UCLA rushers, uh, the Utah rushers here. The second level stuff. I mean, th there's there's times where you see him punish defenders, and I I I I thought when he was helping his teammates, that was something really big. I love the power and the finish. I need to probably go back and look at the uh, the Senior Bowl stuff that way and see how that all worked out. But that Penn State rusher is not a bad one that he was that he Good. was uh, he was dealing with. Now, I'll say this about Latham, and I and I. Okay, and you know, I, I covered the Dallas Cowboys here, as everybody well knows. So they're they're hunting the left tackle here, really. They're they're trying to figure out, you know, do they want to kick Tyler Smith, the guard outside? How do they want to deal with that? So Latham is a guy, we're looking at all these tackles. I'm looking at him and I'm going, okay, can he play left tackle? And I, I'm I'm asking, I'm watching, I'm thinking this guy looks like a right tackle. He looks like a guard, you know, I'm just kind of going through it in my head. I, I just remember like at, you know, 342 pounds, I'm thinking, okay, this guy, he does move pretty well and all that. I asked a scout in the league, one of my buddies, I said, Hey, do you think Latham can play left tackle? He goes, no, but I think he could be an all pro guard. And, and I'm like, okay. He's so built now, like a guard. That's yeah. I mean, it's six, six, three That's what we're dealing with right now. I kind of feel like he's going to need to lose some weight to be even better. And, and you know, he started off like as a 360-pound a guy. And then you get the combine, he's 342. So maybe he is going in the right direction. But you talk to people at Alabama, and there were some questions about him moving to left tackle after his sophomore year. And, you know, but that, that you know, Evan Neal was on the, 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 uh, the team at the time. So the team they took they they said no no we're going to play Latham at right tackle because they wanted to try and develop a left tackle and not weaken the right side. So there are things that Alabama did you know maybe this kid can play but I like I say talking to a couple of scouts that 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 do the southeast the one just said man this guy could be an all pro guard. And I wonder John how many of these guys we're looking at at tackle that are going to end up playing guard. And, and I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of, of the guy that I'm, that I'm thinking about here is um, our guy from, uh, from Arizona. Yeah. Morgan, yeah. Morgan. I mean, everybody you talk to is like, oh, he's a guard, he's a guard, he's a guard, but you watch him play there at Arizona. He's got some tackle traits to him, Yep. but you know, if the Cowboys, let me tell you this. I know I'm on a giants podcast here right now. But I'm just talking about it for, uh, uh, you know, if if you're the Dallas Cowboys, you look at these mammoth tackles and to sell to Jerry Jones, my own experience to sell to Jerry Jones about, you know, they, there was a guy named Flozell Adams that played a long time. And so if you describe the player like this guy is mammoth like Flozell Adams, I think there are a couple of those guys in this draft, these mammoth 6'6", 342 pound guys. And I guarantee you everybody's got these tackles sorted differently. Yeah. There, there, there's no consensus. It's probably like the quarterbacks. There's no consensus on these offensive tackles.
Giant fans love a winner. It's why they love Citizens. Named the 2022 Best Bank in the U.S. by The Banker as the official bank of the Giants and sponsor of the huddle. Citizens is made ready for fans of Big Blue. Learn more at citizensbank.com. Two tackles that are interesting to me, Tony. Tyler Guyton, who I think just based on athleticism is probably the most athletic uh, tackle, but his hand mm -hmm. usage is a mess. Yeah. and There's just mm -hmm. a, a lot of work to do with that. Um, Amarius Mims does not have a lot of starts under his belt, but my That's, goodness, that would tape, scare me. That would but scare the tape me. that he has, dude, nobody yeah. gets by him. I mean, nope. He, nope. He, no one gets by him and he looks right. really, really good. I don't know how uh, much of a fearsome, you know, power run blocker he's going to be just because he's so tall, but boy, his pass pro is phenomenal. And then one of my personal favorites is uh Kingsley Suamataia out of yep. BYU. Mm -hmm. Boy, he's a, not quite the athlete Guyton is, but he's really good. And he is nasty. You watch him on tape, finish blocks in the run yeah. game. He will bury guys. But again, much like Guyton, a lot of work to do there in terms of some of the fundamentals. But he has played left and right, which is something that I think, you know, you like when you're trying to figure out a fit for him. I just wonder how much teams think that their old line coaches can coach up those three guys where, yeah. you know, there is some rawness to their games. But boy, the 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 raw talent is just off the charts. Yeah, we did a – before I came on with you, I was with DallasCowboys.com. We did the draft show today, and uh, we did a mock draft, and we traded back. Uh, we picked up a pick from the 49ers. The Dallas doesn't currently have a fourth-round pick. But we picked up a pick. We went back to their spot and picked at 31, and this is who we picked. So, uh, Kingsley, we picked him. And uh, I totally agree with you about – you know, you, you kind of feel like with Brigham Young players that you're always going to get an older guy. <laughs> this is not an older guy. No. This is not an older guy. This guy transferred from Oregon. And the reason he transferred from Oregon is he really, really missed his family. He got homesick and he missed his, uh, his family and he's his Mormon faith. And those are the two things that, you know, when he was at Oregon, you know, Oregon's done a great job of, you know, we talk about Oregon players every year. So that type of thing and BYU has a great history of putting players in this league, but I totally agree with you at six, five, 326 pounds. Maybe a little, maybe some struggle in the Texas game, but the Texas Tech game was really good. And, and so, you know, there's there's some things about with him coordinating a little better with the hands and the feet. But if you try and take him down the middle, he is not going to let you by, you know. And so I, I kind of really, I, I love the way that as a run blocker, when he comes out of a two-point stance, he comes off the ball, he engages, he works him out of the play. He's got impressive second-level blocks. I would say that he runs really, really well, moves well in the open field. Uh, but man, I'll tell you what, he is a he is a good football player. And maybe if you're looking at the tail end of all those tackles, this would be your guy. Am I wrong to really like Roger Rosengarten? I know no, uh, the big no, and game. you're not. And you against, know, and, yeah. I know he stunk against Michigan, but dude, yeah. he's an athlete. He can move. He yeah. has a good punch. I talked to him at the senior bowl. He's got a great attitude on him. Uh -huh. I, I think I feel bad for the kid because his last stuff on tape before the senior bowl was that terrible yeah. game against Michigan, but he's a good player. He's a really good player. And and the thing about Rosengarten is, and this is where my history kind of hurts me because every time that I see a, a, a tall, linear, kind of light tackle, and I go back to David Bakhtiari, uh, Colton Miller. Colton Miller, that's a good one. Yeah, uh, a guy in your backyard there, Nate Soldor, you know, that type, that that linear, long kind of guy. I always say, not enough power, not enough power, not enough power, can't play, can't play, can't play. And then they play 12 years, <laughs> you know. And it, it, it Ro Rosengarten from Washington, you're absolutely right. He's an exceptional foot athlete. His movement skills are outstanding. It doesn't matter if it's run blocking, pass blocking. You rarely see him on the ground. You rarely see him in poor blocking position. He does a great job of getting out of his stance. He can time his feet, his hands. He's fluid. He doesn't. He has the balance not to put his head in the block. There's a lot of times. Let me tell you the one thing I love about this kid. This guy has got a crafty element to his game. And, and I want to say in this way. He'll throw rushers off with the way he times his sets. Have you noticed when sometimes he'll set deep or he'll set really quick on the line and he'll like, he'll, he'll, what we call a short set. Yeah. So like you get ta you get these edges that are so used to rush, rush, rush. I mean, they're going to back up, back up, back up. And then the third or fourth rush, he will set short and stab you at the line and he'll throw you off. 
So I call that a crafty element to his game because he's trying to throw the rushers off with the timing of his sets. And you can't really get a feel for him. I think he's going to be a really good swing tackle to start his career. And I would be surprised if he ends up being like David Bakhtiari and Miller and these other guys that might be that tall, linear kind of player and play it for a long time. All right, let, let's go to guard center, uh, Brian. We're, we're only, we're, we'll only stack offense here, I'll get, and then I'll get a couple nuggets on a couple of defensive guys. Sure. Um, and, and then I have one final question for you about the Cowboys, considering the uh, sure. interest for Giant fans. You know, they haven't been able to beat the Cowboys. When the season yeah, all those wide receivers we talked about, the Cowboy fans are terrified that you guys are going to take one of those cats. You know? uh, they should be. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't guys. know if the Giants are going to pick guys, but it would make a whole lot of sense. Every wide receiver we talked about that you, you guys like, it, it would terrify me as a Cowboy fan. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go guard center here, Brian. Yeah. And, and maybe you have some exclamation. Maybe you don't. I don't know. But you talk to people that you trust around the league that talk to people in front offices, and it seems like the league does not feel like Jackson Powers Johnson is a first-round player. I, I don't understand that at all. I mean, yeah. my gosh, you know, a three, and maybe this is me spoiled watching Dexter Lawrence all the time. All I see Dexter Lawrence do is run over these 305 pound centers like James Bradbury. Yeah. And then I see this 325 pound tank in Jackson Powers Johnson that can also move. And I'm like, why wouldn't a team want this guy playing center for them and be like an easy can't miss first round pick? Yeah, I you know, and I, I think John, a lot of that has to do with um, there's an injury history there. Uh, there's there's two things that he's really dealing with that are that teams are having to dig in on, and uh, uh, both of them are physical things. I, I I can't get into it right now with you. I wish I could. I just it's something that uh, that I have to check on more. But I've heard from a couple of different teams. We're starting to see Graham Barton from Duke elevate over him, and Graham Barton's dealing with his own stuff like that. But and by uh, the way, he looks more like a. Se- I don't know if he has the power to play guard, yeah, but I would be I, fine with him playing center. Yeah, th- that's that's the thing about it is. I mean, there, there's Graham Barton is a really good player, high IQ player. But to get back to to Powers Johnson, there's things medically there that teams are having to to look at physically and uh, some other things as well. So. We're starting to see that maybe some teams, you know, I'll just give you an example. Mel Kuyper didn't have him in a first round mock. Uh, Daniel Jeremiah had him at high one time and now has dropped him down in, in the ranking. Field Yates uh, mentioned how he's talking to teams and they told yeah. him he had him go in the 20s that that's way too high. Yeah, see, and that's, and that's the deal. And I think what's happening right now, to be honest with you, John, is Scouts are catching up. Uh, media scouts are catching up with the the injury history, and are teams comfortable with the medical history? And so, uh, much like uh, uh, Peyton Wilson, the very talented linebacker from North Carolina State, there are things that you have to dig in on him. And I, I have a feeling now, where we had Power Johnson, me personally for the Cowboys at twenty four, I'd absolutely take him. I, I, I would just. You're, you're right. This guy is. He's a tank in the way he plays, the way he gets to the second level. He's physical in the running game. You know, he helps his teammates. You know, 6'3", 328. My gosh, this guy. I mean, when Dallas was really good running the football, they had a good center in Travis Frederick. This guy has got the angles, the second level, the two blocks on one play. He'll bounce from one guy to another guy, he drive his guy out of the hole. He doesn't appear to have the longest arms, but – he does a good job of finding his target. He finishes his opponent. Hands are inside all the Hands time. Hands are inside. He's smart. You don't see him get bust in plays or getting fooled. He loves to play the game. His toughness is impressive. Yeah, that it's if, if teams are getting off of him because of some medical concerns, uh, well, then maybe a team will benefit by by having him on their team or drafting. You know, him. you mentioned scouts that are really good at drafting positions. Can you yeah. send whatever? Cowboys scout dr- scouts offensive linemen for them and send them up here. <laughs> yeah, the Giants, gonna... because the Giants could use oh, some help plug in and that play. Area. We've been trying no. for a while; it hasn't been working. Yeah, plug and play, man. I mean, that's Dallas. The one thing is, Dallas takes a first round offensive lineman that is going to be a plug and play player. They, they they have a great knack for doing that. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with citizens, so go to that retreat. New you moves to the country. 
now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? You know, people come to this podcast, nothing gets them more excited, Brian, than talking about day two guards and centers. It's yeah. sexy. It's it, it, it's exciting. Uh -huh. So um, I love Zach Frazier. I, I, the Giants don't need a center, but I'll, I'll, so I haven't had a chance to talk about him much, but I yeah. watched him a couple weeks ago. And yeah. I don't know if he wrestled in his background, but he the way he's so low to the ground and squatty, he uh -huh. looks like a wrestler the way he plays. Um, I don't think enough people talk about Cooper Beebe. He's a second round player for me all right. day long. I don't care that he bench pressed 20. That right. guy, I, I tweeted this the other day. If you're a linebacker or a defensive back and he's coming at you on one of those, you know, second level blocks, look out because yeah. he's looking to murder you and put you, you know, six feet under. He I like Christian. Mauler. Yeah, yeah, Mauler. I like Christian Haynes out of UConn. Yeah. And then around three, you know, Dominic Pooney is kind of a tweener for me. He looks mm -hmm. like he should be a tackle, but he's not long enough to be a tackle, but I'm not sure he's big enough to be a guard. So I like the player. I just don't know where he fits. I like Isaiah Adams as a guard. And then I'm a big Mason McCormick guy out of South Dakota State. Okay. I think he just has the mentality, physicality, and everything to be a, a, a darn good interior offensive lineman. Then guys with like third, fourth round combo grades for me. I, I like Bordellini out of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, moves better than, you know, he good mover. I think he overextends himself sometimes and bends a little bit too much and leans. Uh, and then you have Zinter and Mahogany, which are kind of like, I think they, in, the, in a year or two, they could be like baseline level starting guards that aren't going to dominate, but aren't going to get you into trouble either. Yeah, I think if Tom Coughlin was still coaching for you guys, Christian Mahogany from Boston College would have a good – Boston College has a, a, a great history of putting offensive linemen in, in the league. They they do. They're tough guys. And so we'll see where Christian Mahogany – if I could circle back real quick, and this is the guy I want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, hit, 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 hit whoever you want. Zach Frazier, and you mentioned him from West Virginia. He, he's a little bit of a – you know, he, he doesn't look as big on tape, but he's 313 pounds. He's really good as a point of attack blocker. He's really good as a, in the passing game as well. He plays on his feet. You don't see him get knocked around or anything like that. He gets in position, as you mentioned, right off the snap. And he's one of those guys that you'll see him who'll get his head all the way across the, 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 the defender and secure blocks, like wide techniques, that one technique, that three technique. Uh, he, can, he has a real feel for that. If you ever have the opportunity, watch him play against Texas. And all we're going to talk about are Texas's defensive tackles, the ones and the threes. You know, Sweat, Murphy, we're going to talk about those guys. He handled those guys. And those guys are going to play in the league. Those guys are going to get drafted pretty highly. And he handled those guys. If he's handling those types of guys, he can handle others uh, in the National Football League. I, I really do like that player a lot. All right, so let, let, let's go express to the defense uh, real quick, Brian. Um, we've been going a while already. I want to waste more of your time. <laughs> no, you're um, not wasting time. I love doing this. Uh, defensive tackle. Give me um, a guy maybe that you like more than most. I'll just throw my two cents out there, Tavanji Sweat. And this is even before the DWI thing. Uh, yeah. This is, yeah. With that put aside, a guy that w fluctuates weight-wise that much is always going to scare me. Mm -hmm. So I, I like a third-round grade on him just because I'm worried about that sort of stuff. Um, any sore thumbs for you, a defensive tackle in terms of either you're much higher or lower on some of these guys than maybe what the consensus Yeah, I, you know what the problem I'm running into, John, is that I, this is a very, and the one techniques, I, I think they're guys, the three techniques, and that's again, working for, you know, covering the Cowboys. Dallas is really looking for a one technique. They're, Not they, a lot of those guys in there. We'll man. see. We'll see what happens. Mike Zimmer. We'll see what happens with Mozzie Smith. If Mike can do something with Mozzie Smith, get the weight back on Mozzie Smith and all that. But you mentioned Sweat. Fisk from Florida State, I think, is a really, really good player. A guy that a guy that uh that I don't know if you've if you've looked at or you've studied all that much. Have you studied Jackson from Texas A&M? Oh, McKinley? McKinley, McKinley, McKinley Jackson. Yes, I have. And I, I saw yeah. him up close at the senior bowl too. And I was very yeah. impressed. I think yeah. for a guy that size, he can push yeah. the pocket a little bit. Yeah, he's three, he's six two. He's three hundred twenty six pounds, and you know this is where I saw a really explosive guy. I saw range. I saw a guy that got off the ball, as you mentioned. He's constantly jarring opponents, and you can see him knocking guys back. The power, the double teams, all those things that he faced. He moves like a much smaller guy, you know, but he's got all that size. And I, I was amazed with how well that he really made you. You see snaps where he is off the ball and, you know, kind of knocked around a little bit. But 
Then again, the next one, he's on the other side of the line of scrimmage. I think he's is equally good playing the nose head up as he is playing in the gap. And I, 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 he's a guy that I like, you know, as you look down potentially in that third, fourth round, uh, the guy that I, and here's one of my LSU guys. Yeah. I don't have much separating him and sweat, by the way, they are not. Yeah, far away there, from there you go. That's that. good. That's nice. good. Then I, that's good to know. The guy that I would be a little worried about is Mason Smith from LSU. Looks like Tarzan, but you don't see it on the field, man. You don't. You sure don't. He was a five-star recruit coming out of college, and he's had two major injuries while he's at LSU. He had a shoulder problem and a knee problem. And he's got a really good first initial step, and then after that, he loses momentum. And I think there's a lot of people that really like this kid a lot. He plays really tall. His pad level is immediately comes up and against double teams, he'll struggle and he'll lose that at the point of attack. I, I like Wingo's it, tape better than his, to be honest. Yeah, with I, I would be, I would kind of be buyer beware about Mason Smith. And here I was praising LSU guys earlier. Uh, this would be a buyer beware thing. If you're looking for one technique tackle. Yeah. You LSU. mentioned ones. I'm curious. How do you sort out these like mid round three techniques? I'll take Fisk out of it. you mentioned him? The, yeah. the Aurororos, the Jenkins, the Dorlises, the Michael Halls, like yeah. that group. How do you kind of sort through that mess? I, I like the thing I, you know, I Jenkins to me, if you, if you Mozzie Smith out of Michigan and Mozzie came to the league and had problems with his, the get off and you wonder I'm like, is that him or is it the scheme? You watch Chris Jenkins play some of the similar problems of getting off. I mean, they play such a read and react defense yeah. there at Michigan, and you wonder how it's fed. I love Dorless. I think Dorless could play any one of the spots out of Oregon. Uh, Mike Hall from uh, Ohio State, another guy that I really liked. Inconsistent, uh, though. He's a great athlete, it, but I want to see great, him more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but him – uh, Carter from uh from Duke. Duke, yeah, good player. I I think those are all those are all kind of third, fourth round guys. You mentioned Wingo Taylor uh, from Miami. I think those are guys that you know are all kind of in that in that group. But I I do like Dorless from Oregon quite a bit. Okay, uh, give me one notable thing from your edge group that people should know about. I'll tell you what I think that if you're looking for a complete player. Uh, and I know we talk about Dallas Turner as being the potentially the best one at Alabama. I got verse from Florida State as a better player, and he I'll plays tell you why. So much power, Brian. Oh, it's so much fun to watch. The, the thing with verse is that, that with his ability to play the run and also rush the passer. Give me these complete guys. I don't. I don't need a one trick pony, as we say in scouting world. I don't need a guy that's just a great pass rusher. The thing with Verse, I know you know he transferred from Albany, which is a story in itself. But the fact that he, the way that he plays at Florida State, the explosiveness, the way he plays with power, the way he plays with the point of attack, give me that guy. I have a chance to be really wrong about Chop Robinson, by the way. I got him in the second round. I know there's some people that probably have him a little bit higher. Yeah, me too. But, man... <sighs> I, the, the upper body that's kind of thin, the lower body that has the power is nice. I don't know if I always see it with Chop Robinson, though. And then Latu from UCLA, there's another one of those medical concern guys. The guy is a freak type of a pass rusher. But, you know, the medical retirement when he was at Washington, he went to UCLA. There's a lot of questions about that guy. But I think Turner scares me a little bit because I watched Braswell on the other side. It seemed like he got more pressures there at Alabama. You know what? You know, I so. walked away thinking the same thing. I like Braswell. Yeah. yeah. And if I could give you a guy down the line yeah. uh, to, to check out uh, is the University of Houston has uh, a, a, an edge rusher that I really, really like. And I'll tell you what, uh, Nelson Caesar is his name. And he's 6'3", he's 254 pounds. Um, he can stand up. He can put his hand down. Check out Nelson Caesar. If you got this guy plays with a true, true burst. He's 6'3", 254, as I mentioned. You know, he's one of those guys. He does not let blockers get into his body at all. And he can split guys on the goal line. He's a physical tackler. So I'm talking about potentially a day three guy right there. But Nelson Caesar yeah, is a guy that I need to mention. 
All right, I want to hit DBs real quick. The Giants have two needs there, Tony. Uh, Brian, quarterback, uh, yeah. I think, you know, you got that group that's going to go one very early two. Then you got a bunch of second, third round guys here yeah. that can play inside and outside. I really uh -huh. like Renardo Green out of Florida State. I like Mike Santer still out of Michigan. I think both are very yeah. good football players. Um, who do you like in that mid midday two type of area, either inside or outside? Because quite frankly, the Giants could use both. The the Sands are still a guy from Michigan is a is a quality quality player and you know the thing about him is though he's a little bit of a shorter guy, but you know he was a converted wide receiver and I'll tell it you shows. what though, it it shows because he knows how to read routes and like you said you can play him in inside outside, he's got quick feet it's a hard guy to get away he's smart he's tough he's willing, he is a smaller guy that's the thing about it the guy that I like. And, and again, here's a guy we probably have to check some injury history on a little bit. But Kyrie Jackson out of Oregon is a 6'4", 194-pound corner. He's a transfer from Alabama. He's a long, athletic cover guy. He's got a lot of physical tools to his play. He's very competitive. He wants to be a part of the action. He's not a blow-you-up type of guy. He'll wrap up. I've seen him on the blitz. He's had six, su su success attacking the pocket. Easy for me to say right then and there. But but he mainly plays as an outside corner, and he's going to travel with the number one. His best snaps are when he can play and press man and disrupt guys off the line. He'll use his length. Uh, I love the way he challenges receivers. Uh, you know, he might need a little help with the change of direction stuff. He gets a little handsy at time. But other than that, man, this guy is a really talented player with some size. All right. Then finally, safety, Tony. Uh, I keep calling you Tony. Tony Pauline is my co-host on draft season. I've been doing that all week. I do all these interviews. I apologize, Brian. Um, <laughs> That's OK. I, I, I just I just answer whatever you call me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cole Bishop is a safety I really like. Anyone yeah. from this group, which I think is really muddled in that day two area, that that sure. really sticks out to you as a guy that can. The Giants are probably going to go to the split safety, you know, yeah. scheme where you need the guys to be a little bit more versatile. Who are some of the guys you like that might be able to fit into that mold? Yeah, the Cowboys are the same way with Mike Zimmer. He Mike wants uh, guys that play with range. Well, everybody wants range safeties and stuff, but they have to be interchangeable. Safeties is what you're looking at right there. To be able to play down in the box, play back. Uh, the, my, my favorite guy when it comes to this type of play is Tyler Newbin from Minnesota. And, you know, we'll see where he goes in this draft. I think he's the best safety in the country. I think the awareness he plays with the instincts when others are standing still at Minnesota on defense, he's in attack mode. Everybody's kind of trying to figure things out. He know he's coming. He's going to, he's got straight line speed. He's got quickness. He's got a burst. He punishes ball carriers with his closing speed. He makes a ton of plays downhill. I love the way that he tracks the football. He's got a feel for how to play in order uh, to play through uh, the receiver in order to make the play. So I, I really, really am a big fan of his. I, I know you mentioned uh, you mentioned the uh, Cole Bishop out of Utah. I think there's a guy that you look at the length, the build. He can cover some ground. He's one of those type of players that can play near the line of scrimmage. He can play with some depth. He's asked to play a bunch of spot. He's not bad at mixing it up at the line. Again, uses a blitzer, run defender, forward in a hurry. Uh, I think he could be a little inconsistent as a tackler, though. I've seen him wrap up, but I've also just seen him throw his body into the guy and hope for the best right there. So there's a, there's, it's quite a group. I, I know that people have talked about uh, with – uh, Kalen Bullock as well from USC, kind of the true guy. I mean, he's 188 pounds. He really looks th uh, thin on tape. But he gets the ball, though, man. He, Ooh, he does, does he he get the ball. He does get the ball. He's a fluid-moving guy. When he's He has no trouble coming forward. His range, he, that's the thing about him, is his range. He can overlap and cover from different areas in the yeah. field. He plays with his eyes, read and react. I mean, there's a lot of really positive things to like about Kalen Bullock. All right, final question, and I like that. Like to think that I keep track of all of these teams in the Cowboy in the Giants division, like yeah. the Cowboys. And I have a pretty good idea what Washington's doing. I have a pretty good feel for what Philly's trying to do, extending all their young guys early and all that stuff. But Brian, I got to be honest with you, I can't for the life of me figure <laughs> out what the heck the Cowboys are doing with Dak Prescott. Um, how they're handling this is mind-boggling to me from a salary cap perspective. And just if they really like Dak Prescott, well, he's going to be basically an unrestricted free agent next offseason if they don't do something. Right. And if they want to keep him, 
it's he's either going to become the highest paid quarterback in football because he's going to could basically dictate to the Cowboys whatever he wants. And, and they still have Lamb that they haven't extended. Michael Parsons extension eligible. They haven't done him yet. Uh, can you give me some idea of what the Cowboys, they have their coach on the last year of his deal. What's their long-term mm. plan here moving forward in terms of getting what well, really is the, the core of their team moving forward? Yeah. A lot to unpack there and you kind of covered it all. Uh, yeah, John, it, it's uh we're all kind of trying to figure that out as well. Um, you know, they could have flipped some switches, did some things. They created a couple of avoidable years. That they were able to kind of get a little bit of cap relief on. Um, you're right. If they let him get the free agency, there's an opportunity for somebody to grab him. Then you only get the compensatory three uh, likely out of that. If that's the case. Um, yeah. There's a lot of questions there. Um, some unfortunate things have happened to them in this regard. Uh, they didn't, they didn't react quick enough uh, to get him done. They didn't have a fifth year option on him. They, you know, but they kept letting it go. They let Kenny play out and play out and play out. And it, it finally, it's caught up with them in that way. They keep kicking the can down the road, but now they're in a situation where there's no trade. You know, now if you wanted to, you could probably go to him and say, listen, we have a deal. Would you be interested? And, you know, he could say yes or no, but um, yeah, uh, this is, this is a situation where, there's not a lot of uncertainty, you know, that I believe they're going to pay him. I don't think they're going to pay him now, but when they're going to try and see if they can compete uh, next year with it. And we'll see, they have a history of signing guys before training camp opens. You know, we get there, they make a big announcement. Oh, Dak Prescott has signed an extension, da, 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 da. But there's, um, I just have a feeling that they're going to figure this thing out and Dak Dak has reasons to be here for his off the field stuff too, which is very promise. Uh, it's a very big part of what he does, but uh, I think Dallas is going to get the deal done. Uh, but there's also a side of me that says, I wouldn't be surprised if they moved on from Mike McCarthy moved on from Dak Prescott and just kind of reset this thing, you know, is Jerry and Steven Jones aren't going anywhere. The front office is not going anywhere. If you're a general manager that, needs to have keep your job because of your quarterback, you probably would have had this thing done, but they're not going anywhere. So they, they feel like that they could probably wait this thing out and make him play another year and then come back to the table and see if it's good enough or not. If it's good enough, uh, they'll, they'll pay him a huge amount of money. As you just mentioned, if it ends up to being like it was against green Bay, they could very well move on from this guy. I think that's where we're at right now. You think any chance Lamb gets extended before the season? Uh, that's one man. That's a that's that's another good question because he seems to check every box. Like there are he no does he, he does he's got Lamb. he's gotten better he's gotten better every year. I will say this, and this is how Diggs got his deal done at the cornerback spot. If you're not the guy resetting the market, Stephen Jones will deal with you. He he's really good at. Okay, I don't have to be the highest paid wide receiver. But if I'm the third highest paid wide receiver, you know, Stephen Jones can figure out ways to work with you that way. He he's really good at doing that kind of stuff. But when you when you're the resetter of the market like what's going to happen with Michael Parsons, you know, we saw what Josh Allen just got in Jacksonville, right? You know, and Brian Burns from us. And Brian Burns, yeah. That's the same. I mean, that, those are only things that Stephen Jones is going to have to deal with uh, uh, down the road. So uh, I think it's easier to figure out what they might do in the draft than it is to figure out what they're going to do with these contracts. Brian, awesome stuff. Tell the folks where they can find all your fantastic work. Well, I appreciate that, John. Again, I, I the utmost respect for the giant organization. Uh, thank you for the bank that sponsors uh, your show for putting us on today. Uh, yeah, it uh, all my stuff is uh, I'm at 105.3 The Fan. Uh, two to seven, Monday through Friday. Uh, you can catch us on the Odyssey app if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Uh, I do Love of the Star podcast with Bobby Belt. That's something on, uh, we do on Odyssey as well. And then uh, also the draft show, which I do with DallasCowboys.com. Uh, been running on that for 11 years now, so that's part of it. So all that uh, at Twitter, at Brian Broadus. Uh, I welcome all questions. If you're a Giants fan and you have a question about maybe a player or two, I'll be happy to answer those questions. Just let me know you're a Giants fan too. I always uh, like interacting with uh, fans, especially this time of year 
with all the work that we do uh, covering all these players. Brian, great insight, my friend. I always love catching up with you every year around this time. It's a ton of fun. I just love talking to you. Um, I think we become friends over the years, and I absolutely and I, and, I, and, I, and I and I just enjoy talking to you. Good luck as we sprint about one week until draft, my friend. Thank you, John. Appreciate that, and uh, you guys take care out there. Brian Broadus, thanks for joining us on the Giants Little Podcast, brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. We'll see you next time, everybody. Hey, guys. Back at the playground again, huh? Yep. You know what this playground could use? A wine country. Heck, yeah. And some waves. So we could go surfing. Oh, <laughs> I love that. A redwood forest would be cool. I'm in. Ah, ski slopes. Let's do it. Um, tenor girl go shopping. Yeah, baby. Wait. Did we just invent California? Discover why California is the ultimate playground at visitcalifornia.com. So I, I know you've got a lot going on, but remember, I'm here for you. So bother me when no one's listening because I will. Bother me when it feels like it won't get better because it can. Bother me because you're never a bother. Whether it's a low point or a crisis, get help for yourself or a friend. Learn more at neverabother.org or call or text 988, available 24-7.